All right. This one's really long. Um, right. I do not recall a time that I had a healthy relationship with food. As a child in elementary school, I recall eating out of boredom and often using candy for emotional support. Perhaps this was related to my mother informing me of my overweight status in second grade. She only had been reflecting the concern of my pediatrician. I often reflect on how I might have had that conversation differently with my own hypothetical daughter. Perhaps it was the kids making fun of me in school for my chubbiness. Kids can be cruel in this regard. Furthermore, my world growing up was rampant with messages regarding the perfect body and female sexuality. Barbies, Disney princesses, Jem, She-Ra. Uh, my mother reflecting on my wedding day weight and constant dieting. I remember in elementary school watching older girls and picking out which bodies I liked and how I wanted mine to look when I grew up. My eating disorder officially developed in high school. I'm telling you this bit to provide an example of a child who was affected by social values and weight stigma from an early age and did who, not, did, who did not eat intuitively. I certainly acknowledge the genetic component of the eating disorder and migration theory. However, it's also critical to evaluate the influence of cultural values on children's mental well-being and development of eating disorders during childhood, including the context of genetic predisposition. After my eating disorder developed at age 17, I did weight restore in college, but the disorder behaviours and thoughts continued. I relapsed in grad school, which was 10 years ago. My period disappeared almost immediately, and I haven't really missed it for the last decade. I've been managing my eating disorder like a chronic disease, maintaining a BMI on the upper limit of too low, while eating a seamlessly generous caloric allotment that's nonetheless too low for my energy expenditure. That way, my doctors and family would not question me too much. However, in November, I was diagnosed with osteopenia. I realized that the eating disorder lied to me, that the eating disorder would kill me if I didn't do something. I envisioned a previous patient of mine who was in a wheelchair and in a chronic state on chronic steroids, long-term use causes osteoporosis. She was close to my age and had fallen while transferring from her wheelchair to the toilet and broke her femur. I resolved to change my current trajectory and I dove headfirst into recovery. I increased my calories and entered extreme hunger. That noise is the cats running around, if you can hear it. My dietitian seems less skeptical of my extreme hunger binges, but has since encouraged me to respond to mental hunger. Oh, my dietitian seems skeptical. Thank you so much for all the videos on extreme hunger and mental hunger. My question is this. What about extreme hunger at night? The unrelenting hunger that wakes one up from sleep, or the mental hunger that hits at three, three minutes after you're in bed, despite getting a load of calories in the day, and having gone to bed satisfied. Since starting recovery, my sleep has been terrible in general, but on top of the night sweats, some nights, I wake two to three times with this extraordinary hunger. hunger. If I chose an acceptable waking hour, if, it, if close to an acceptable waking hour, I'll try and wait it out because when I respond, I end up being awake for at least an hour. When it's the middle of the night, I do respond eventually, but this is just destroying my sleep. Is this common? Um, are my ghrelin levels out of whack? I keep reassuring myself that I'm not developing night eating syndrome, but surely that this is helping my cortisol levels thoughts. And that's from B. All right. Well, so that's quite a long email. A couple of points. Yes, absolutely. Cultural influences from a long, young age can lead to, well, it can lead to body image stuff. And you don't have to have an eating disorder to have body image stuff. A lot of people have body image stuff. And that is because, just like you said, Barbies all over the place and everybody thinks that you should be thin you do have to have the genetic predisposition for that body image stuff to turn into a restrictive eating disorder absolutely but we've got to think of cultural influences as a contributing factor and those are also things that in the rewiring process in recovery from an eating disorder we've got to address those and rewire those we have to retrain our brain we have to teach our brain not to give a shit about those things now to your question about the extreme hunger at night. Well, yes, that absolutely is common. And if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, it makes perfect sense why your brain would decide, you know what, I'm gonna eat a shit ton of food at night. Um, well, even when you're not in recovery, so even when I was not in recovery, even when I was restrictive, restricting and compulsively exercising and denying that I even had anorexia, I um, still, ate a lot more food at night. If I was gonna eat food, it was generally at night. And that seems to be true of a lot of people with restrictive eating disorders. And so it just feels safer for many of us to eat at night. 
And that makes sense because imagine if you were migrating, you can't like sit around and eat. Daytime has got to be go, go, go time. You've got the daylight, you've got to move your ass. You've got to get going. You've got to get busy getting out of there. Nighttime's not such a good time to travel. And so if you're going to eat at all, it makes sense that you should eat at night when you're resting a little bit more, when you're not migrating as much. So I find that a lot of people with restrictive eating disorders, when they feel safer eating at night, and that was definitely true for me, even when I was not in recovery. Now, when I did go into recovery, the night eating definitely got worse. And that makes sense as well, because you, you, it's almost like you're, you, that's your safe time to eat and your brain's just like, more food's going to come then, get, get as much in as possible. Um, and what happens when we start to eat more food? So you think about it like your, your brain thinks that food is scarce when you're barely eating anything. And if you are eating, it's just fruits and vegetables. So your brain's basically like, we're in a famine environment here. What is the point in waking them up to eat? Because there's nothing to eat really. And then you go into recovery and you start eating more food and your brain's just like, hell yeah, wakey, wakey, time to eat again. Because what's happening is when your brain realizes that there's a food in the environment, it's prioritizing nutritional rehabilitation over sleep. It is prioritizing you eating food over you sleeping. And that feels like shit for a while because you just walk around like a zombie because you've got like barely any sleep because you woke up at 2 a.m. and needed to start eating. But it doesn't last forever, does it? Because when you nutritionally rehab rehabilitate fully, your brain no longer has to do that. Your brain is only prioritizing nutritional rehabilitation, food over sleep, because it knows that it desperately needs food. Your brain always is gonna want sleep. So when you're nutritionally rehabilitated and your brain isn't in such a desperate circumstance, it's absolutely gonna prioritize sleep. Your brain's just doing what's intelligent. Your brain's doing what makes the most sense. And it just knows there's food about and I've gotta get as much of it in as I can possibly get. And if that means waking up in the middle of the night to eat a load of food, that is what is gonna happen. So be patient with it. And generally the insomnia stuff gets better as you nutritionally rehabilitate. You, oh, the other thing is, is you have to eat more during the day. And we often fall into this trap, don't we, Dave? Dave, we often fall into this trap of being like, well, I'm gonna eat all this food at night anyway. So, oh, Sorry, Dave. Hmm. I'm going to eat all this food at night anyway. She's fishing her tail at me. She's not happy with me. I was just trying to get a cuddle, Dave. I'm sorry. Um, you, like, sometimes fall into this trap of, I'm going to eat all this food at night anyway. So, you know, I'm not going to eat, like, I don't know, copious amounts of chocolate bars and chocolate muffins and all that stuff in the day because I know I'm going to eat it at night. You absolutely have to eat it in the day too regardless of whether you're going to eat it at night. Just for context, the reason that I'm grabbing Dave is because she's chewing my, my iPhone charger. Dave, and she won't give up, because that's the kind of cat Dave is. Dave does not give up, do you, Dave? Um, and so... Oh, I've completely forgotten where I was. Anyway, so... <laughs> the moral of the story is that Night eating is completely very, very, very common in eating disorder recovery, and it's not a problem. Focus on eating as much as you can during the day and eat the scary foods during the day. The types of foods that you eat at night are often more indicative or, or of actually what you really want to eat. Most of us feel less inhibited at night, so it's like that's when all the chocolate and the fatty foods come out if you're going to have it. You've got to push those foods into the day as well. You've got to start eating those foods in large amounts in the day also, and continue to eat them at night when you wake up and you want them. And just trust that your body knows what it's doing and if it's waking you up and asking you to eat, that's because, guess what, you need to eat. All right, hope that helps, bye.